cracking. We have two wonderful speakers this evening, Abby and Aisha, are joining us. Um, and I guess we shall kick off with Aisha. So, um, yeah, Aisha has basically uh, made the decision to pursue a career in tech last year. And she is currently in the early months of her very first tech role. She's striving to finally be able to finish a book before meet for a book club meeting and is looking forward to spending her Sundays playing pool again. We're getting there. We're getting there. So take it away, Aisha. Okay. Hopefully everyone can see that. Thumbs up. Perfect. Right. So um, Sarah's already introduced me, but I want to say thank you everyone for coming today. Um, today I'm hoping to speak about how I got to grips with a large code base. So um, as Sarah mentioned earlier, so I am a career switcher. I studied something completely different at university, um, joined a boot camp, and am currently in my first tech role. Um, as you can guess, it was quite a large jump from working on boot camp projects, which have only, which I think the longest one I worked on was only about two weeks long. Uh, and that was like, we only, there were only four of us in a team. So quite small projects to um, joining software and getting put on a project that had about 20 other developers on it, uh, which they had been, and they had been working on this code base for about nine months or so. Um, I have to admit, I did try and count how large, how many lines of code the code base had, but I stopped at about 10,000. Um, so it's, it's quite a hefty code base. And so I just wanted to share um, what I found useful, uh, trying to understand what was going on in this code base and some lessons I've learned along the way. So this is quite a short talk. So this list is by no means extensive. Uh, this is just what I personally find useful when I first joined. So let's get into it. Right, so one of the first things um, I focused on was understanding the folder structure. Um, and this was really important because it made it easier to find um, something, even when you didn't know the name of a certain function, as long as you kind of knew what it was doing or where it was located. For example, if it was in the front end, um, if it was on a certain page, you would go to that page and then you would hopefully see it and then you could dive even deeper that, that way. Um, so this is an example from well, a much smaller code base. I think it's from the Gov UK front end code base. And as you can see, they have, um, it, it's quite tidy. Assets are, not, are in one place, components are in one place. So I know if I'm looking for um, how they've styled buttons, I can just go into components and I should find it there. But yeah, so different um, projects and different companies have different folder stru structures. So it's always good trying to um, familiarize yourself with how, how they are organized. Um, and sometimes they'll be in the readme, um, the information you need, or sometimes you just need to ask a colleague, or sometimes if they're really tidy, you can just kind of guess if they are arranged in a logical way. Okay, so the second thing I found really useful was um, looking at integration tests. So for those of you who don't know, integration tests are, um, I suppose, different from unit tests, which only test a certain function, and they test like a pathway, for example. So um, in the project I was working on, in the front end of it, they had an integration test, which was just changing uh, to see if um, a user could change their password. So by looking at the integration test, you can kind of see which um, functions get called and kind of understand uh, how things flow within this code base. The next thing I wanted to share was my favorite uh, VS Code extension, GitLens. I cannot, <laughs> I cannot tell you how many times GitLens has saved me. Um, so what it is, is basically a, um, um, 
as I mentioned, it's a VS Code extension which shows you when a certain line uh, when a certain line of code was modified and what commit or, or ticket it was associated with. So I've um, pulled an example from the um, Gov UK code base earlier, and hopefully you can see. And it's not it, it, it's quite low contrast, but on line thirty eight. Because I was I, I had hovered on this line, I could see that um, Chris Hillscott modified this line three years ago, and the title of the ticket was uh, or the title of the commit was prevent double clicking form submissions, which is great. And I think if you hover over that Git lens message, it will give you even more information. So this was a different message I hovered over, but it'll tell you the exact date and exact time this was modified, and also the commit hash. And if you, um, hopefully you can see my cursor, but if you click on this, it'll show you what, what else changed in that commit as well, which is great. So yeah, very useful extension, especially if, if most of the commits are, have a relevant ticket, you can also see how someone solves a certain problem especially if it's a similar problem and you can see, um, give you ideas as, as to how you could solve the problem you might have. So would really recommend that one. Now, the next thing I found useful was just a plain old search or a find tool. Now, most, most IDEs have this and it is so useful when you're navigating a large code base to be able to click into things. So um, I think, for example, with VS Code, if you hover over a function or a component and you control click, it goes to the definition. Um, and that's quite useful to see what that component actually is um, and things like that. And yeah, so either, whether you just are searching for a certain string, um, just say if something appears on the front end and maybe it says integration tests, for example, and you just want to look for that component in the code, you can maybe, if they don't have a CMS, for example, you can hopefully just search for that string and find out where it appears to find out what's calling it so you can make the changes that you need to. Um, you can also search for class names if you inspect and it's not a weird class name or if they don't use style components, that's also something that's useful. Otherwise, on the back end, something I mainly used was find all implementations or usages. Um, that is, I found that very useful trying to navigate this massive API, just figuring out everywhere this model was used and noticing similarities of places it was called to figure out what it was actually doing and how it was different from another model of a similar name. Right, well, and lastly, um, just use your colleagues, ask questions. Um, it is always easier to have someone show you around. Um, so something you could ask if, if they have maybe five minutes just to show you around the structure of the code base, you, most people would happily say yes. And plus you get to meet your colleague and spend more time with them. So that's always great. Okay, so um, some lessons I've learned from this is mainly don't try and understand every single line or every single file, just learn enough to do what you need to do and eventually understanding will just trickle through. Um, and the last thing I learned was that, yeah, you should believe in yourself because you can, you can do the work. And if you get into trouble, just don't worry about asking for help. So um, that's it from me. Um, my contact details are on the screen if you wanted to ask any questions. But otherwise, thank you for listening to me today. Yay, well done. Great job, Asha. Um, really useful, usable tips there. Um, 
And yeah, well, very well done. Thank you very much. Um, if you, like Asha, would like to give a talk, our CFPs are always open 24 seven. Um, so you can just let us know that you're keen. We're lovely place to get some practice. <laughs> Great job, Asha. Thank you so much. Um, great. So our second speaker of today is Abby Mitchell. Abby is a quantum developer advocate at IBM. Um, and she joined IBM in 2009, firstly as a full stack web developer, and uh, now does the, the quantum developer advocacy. She's currently working on something called Kizkit which is IBM's open source software for quantum computers. Um, as a primarily self-taught developer, she is passionate about encouraging people from any background to consider pursuing their interests in technology. So you're in the right place. Thank you and welcome, Abby. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I joined in IBM in 2019, not 2009. <laughs> oh, sorry. Like, I don't even know, 12 or something. <laughs> Been a long week already. Um, I, I was an early an early adopter of quantum computing when I was a wee child. They'd hired me straight out of primary school. <laughs> um, great. Let me see if I can just share my screen. Um, okay. All right. Can you guys see it? All good, great. Um, all right, uh, hello everyone. Thank you very much for having me and um, yeah, and for embarking on your first kind of journey into the realm of quantum computing. Um, the kind of objectives of this talk is to kind of give you guys a very, high level overview of quantum computing uh, more generally. I'm not gonna be talking a lot about kind of the intricate physics side of things. Firstly, because I'm not a physicist, I'm a software developer, and I'm assuming that most of you are also kind of of similar backgrounds. So I'm gonna do my best to talk about things um, in a not very physics-y way, in more of a code-based way or a more kind of abstract concept level. Um, I will, uh, there is a fair amount of kind of more theory-based things that we probably need to talk about before we kind of get into the coding. Um, and in fact, probably most of the um, talk will not be very kind of hands-on code based, but um, I'm hoping we'll have time for um, a short demo um, at the end where you can start seeing some, some actual quantum code. Um, right, so to just get started, I just want to introduce a, kind of a real world problem. Um, so let's say I want to go on um, a summer road trip around the UK and I want to go to 14 different cities. Um, how I would, you know, love to have, you know, some computer program, calculate all the possible different routes between these 14 cities and um, kind of give me, give me an idea of what the different routes are that I could take. If you have 14 cities, this is probably about 3 billion total combinations of different routes, um, which could probably take an average computer like a few seconds to, um, to compute, which isn't too bad. Um, but let's say, actually, I want to extend my holiday and do double the amount of cities, or no, not, not quite double, let's go to 22 cities. Um, and then we see that there's actually an exponential increase in the amount of routes that I could potentially take. And with this exponential increase in the amount of routes, we also have a massive increase in the amount of, I guess, computational power you would need to compute this. So this just by kind of not even doubling the problem, we are creating a problem that actually will probably take about 2000 years for a classical computer to be able to solve. Um, so, and if you imagine if this is where kind of a quantum computer could potentially help um, these, this kind of very um, intense 
uh, real world problems. Okay, my summer holiday road trip is, is quite a simple one, but if you imagine applying this to um, you know, global logistics or supply chains or, or things like that, um, then you very, very quickly, um, your problem can become a lot too complex for um, you know, classical computers to be able to tackle. Um, so every time you add new variables, your challenge gets bigger. Um, and the idea of, of quantum computers, maybe not now, but in the hopefully not too distant future, is that we will start to be able to tackle some of these um, increasingly complex uh, problems. Huh. Um, yeah, so a bit more of like an overview of what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to give you a bit more, a little bit, very quick background into classical computing, because I know as developers, we don't necessarily always know what's happening on our actual machines. Um, and it's easier to, to learn about the concepts of quantum computing if you know a little bit about how it compares to classical computing. Um, we're also going to talk about the a few key concepts in quantum computing. We're going to talk about the development of quantum computers up till now, and then the potential of where we hope to go um, moving forward. Um, and then at the end, we're going to um, start seeing some, some actual quantum code. OK, so classical computing. Um, some of you may know about bits. Everything on our computers is made up of bits. That's how we encode information on classical computers. A bit um, can be in a state of either zero or one, a yes or a no, kind of a true or a false value. We, and then as we build up the number of bits, we can do more um, complex, um, you know, calculations and we can represent information um, you know, more in a more sophisticated way. Um, a single bit with a value of zero is equivalent to the number zero or the Boolean false. Um, a single bit with the value of one um, represents the number one and the Boolean value of true. And then if you want to go up at numbers higher than one, you need to add more bits. So, um, one zero is the number two, you can go, and you can go up to every natural number with, with this system. Um, if, you know, when you're talking about your, the kind of capacity of your, your computers or your mobile phones, you start talking about bytes and kilobytes um, and gigabytes. So my 32 gig um, iPhone is 256 billion bits. Um, so as you can see, uh, the, the bits add up, add up quickly. Um, and in order to kind of do operations and do calculations and all the complicated things that go into our computers and, our, and, the, and the code that we write, um, when you abstract that right down to the machine level, um, essentially what you're doing is operating, uh, putting these kind of logic gate operators on those bits. So these um, a simple one is this not gate here. This line represents like an, a bit going in and a bit going out. Um, and a not gate um, will essentially flip the value of the bit. So if you have a zero going in here, then a one will come out here. Or if a one goes in here, then a zero will come out here. And yeah, that's, that's just one example. There are a ton of different logic gates. Um, and when you chain them all together, you can start doing more and more interesting things. So, um, you know, th this is an, a, kind of just a visual <laughs> example of what um, a big kind of circuit would look like um, with a whole bunch of different logic gates that um, probably does something very similar, very, very simple. Don't ask me what this one does. I just found this off Google Images. But you kind of, you, you get the idea. Building up logic gates, manipulating the bits helps you um, do your, your calculations and your experiments on your, on your machine. Okay, that's probably a good foundation for what you need for classical computing. So I want you to bear those concepts in mind when we start talking about quantum computing. 
Um, we're going to talk about three main um, concepts. Um, I do want to say that when we start getting into the more kind of quantum -y things, please don't worry if stuff goes over your head or um, it doesn't make any sense. Um, just you know, try follow along as best you can. And hopefully this gives you a bit of a foundation that you can then use to go on and, and do, your, um, do your own um, research and exploration in, in your own time. So the first concept we're gonna talk about is this idea of superposition. Um, so when we talk about classical bits, we really what those mean in a physical sense are just electrical impulses, switches that are turned on and off to represent zeros and ones. Um, for quantum computers, in order to encode information for a quantum computer, we use uh, quantum bits. And these are essentially subatomic particles like photons and electrons, basically very, very, very small to that tiny, tiny size. Classical physics kind of breaks down and that's where you start to enter, enter the realm of quantum physics. And you get um, a bunch of different cool physics principles that you can play around with to encode information in different ways. So for a qubit, you might start in a state of zero or one, but then what we would do is we would put it into something called a superposition. A superposition means that our qubit, when it's in that superposition state, is not necessarily a zero or a one, but it could kind of occupy any kind of state in between. There's the best way of thinking about it is kind of a sphere of possibility. Um, or if you imagine a coin flip, when, you know, when the coin starts in your hand, it's either a head or a tail. When you flip it, you know, what, what state is it then when it's flipping through the air? Like, you don't know. That's kind of a similar analogy to what it means when a qubit goes into a superposition. And when, um, oh, and to represent, um, in, in order to get a, a qubit into its superposition, we add this logic gate, um, kind of similar to the, the gates that I showed you a bit earlier. This gate is called a Hadamard gate. So we can turn um, a qubit from its kind of zero or one state, normally we start in a zero state, put it into this superposition um, using a Hadamard gate. Um, and when the qubit is in that superposition, that's when we can start to do operations on the qubits um, to kind of do various experiments and calculations. Um, I just put this little picture of Schrodinger's cat down here because if you've ever heard of the idea of Schrodinger's cat, like, oh, the cat is kind of alive and dead at the same time in the box and you don't really know, that's kind of probably the most kind of well-known idea of, of what superposition is. Like it kind of comes from this um, idea of Schrodinger's, Schrodinger's cat. Um, Right. And then another principle I want to talk to you about is kind of the idea of your superposition state kind of collapsing. And this is when, when say we have this qubit in, us, in, in our superposition, we don't know exactly what the value is. And our act of observing this qubit, of doing a measurement on that qubit, kind of forces that qubit to collapse into a state, into the original states of either zero or one. Um, and this is a is, this is a completely random um, random process. Um, you can think of it again like that coin flip. When you flip a coin, when it lands on the table again, it's either going to be a head or a tail, a zero or a one, um, and it's going to be a 50-50 chance of of getting either. If if assuming you haven't altered the qubit at any point in that superposition, so if you literally just take your qubit, put it into superposition, measure that qubit it will collapse down 50% of the time to zero, 50% of the time to one. And this is really useful because what this means is we can then combine um, quantum computers with classical computers because the start and end kind of states of the qubits are zeros and ones. So we could essentially do some classical computation, um, feed that classical bits of zeros and ones encoded information into the quantum computer. And then the quantum computer can do some um, kind of qubit manipulation on that. We can measure the outcome. And then we've got our answers back in zero and one form, which we can then do more classical uh, programming on. So this is kind of a nice way to show that quantum computers and classical computers work um, 
can work in tandem and work together. Um, and yeah, so quantum computing at its core is essentially taking qubits, putting them into superposition, doing operations on those qubits while they're in superposition, and then measuring the outcomes of that, and then processing the outcomes um, in a classical way. Okay, the next um, concept that I want to talk about is this idea of entanglement, um, which is the idea that you can have two qubits that are entangled together and they form one quantum system. So by doing something to one qubit in that entangled state will automatically affect the other qubit, no matter how far away the qubits are. And that, ch you know, the, that change can happen instantaneously. So Einstein called this concept spooky action at a distance, which I personally think is a much better name than entanglement. But anyway, um, I don't know why we changed it. Um, but this is the, the reason that Einstein thought that this was so spooky because, you know, at the, you know, at the beginning of the, the 20th century, um, when quantum mechanics was quite new as a field, um, nothing, it was thought that nothing could possibly travel faster than the speed of light. So if you have these two qubits that are entangled and you put them on opposite ends of the universe, um, and by doing something to qubit A, you might you instantaneously affect qubit B, how is that information getting you know, transported in that over the, that large distance? It's and if it, if it's happening instantaneously, what is cause and effect if the cause and the effect happen at the same time? It kind of this is where people's heads start to kind of melt and I think it's you know time time to to move on and get back to the um, the computation side of things. Um, if you want to know more about this, go and uh, read some physics papers and yeah, learn a whole lot of a whole lot of maths. Um, and like that diagram I showed you earlier with the classical computers of how we can build up. Um, classical pro programs with wires and uh, logic gates that do operations on bits. Um, the dis we display things in a very similar way um, for, um, for quantum computing as well. So this is just an example of, of what that same kind of um, gate and circuit structure looks like in, in a quantum um, situation. You can see we have these Hadamard gates here that's putting the qubits into superposition. This is the, um, the measurement gate. So this will kind of essentially um, measure the outcome of the qubit and translate it onto a classical bit of zero or one. And we have some kind of form of entanglements coming in here when you have two two different qubits that are that are kind of joined together. Okay, so now I want to talk about a bit about the the actual quantum computers and the progress that has been made, um, and give you a bit of a of an idea of how we got to where we are right now. Um, we'll talk about. Oh, first I should just say this is what a quantum computer kind of looks like on the inside. Um, it's this really nice kind of gold chandelier looking thing. This is probably the images that you've seen on various like news articles and blogs and stuff like that. Um, yeah, but normally this is actually like wrapped up in a lot of, a lot of insulation and um, yeah, this is kind of what it looks like on the inside. Okay, so history of kind of, the history of quantum computing is, um, somewhat entangled, haha, with the, the history of quantum mechanics. They kind of feed into one each other, to each other. Um, so if we want to talk about the history of quantum computing, we really need to start with the history of quantum mechanics. So um, a key date in, in the history of quantum mechanics was um, the Solvay Conference of 1927. That's where all of the kind of most influential thinkers in physics at the time got together to discuss pure like to purely discuss this new field of quantum mechanics this idea that when you go down to a subatomic level level you know classic classical physics um kind of breaks down and you need these new kind of ideas of quantum mechanics to um to explain what's happening um you know einstein was there bohr marie curie um you know the the whole gang um, if we fast forward to 1982, that's when we um, 
we get Richard Feynman proposing the idea of a of quantum computing as a subject in the 80s. You have kind of emergence of of computing as a as a really influential industry, um, and so we kind of also get the idea of like using perhaps in order to simulate the real world. The real world itself is made up of of you know quantum quantum um states and quantum energies like maybe the best way to simulate the real world is not classically but but in a quantum way um again fast forwarding till 1998 that's when we get the first ever kind of real working quantum computer up until then it had everything had just been theoretical thinking like oh maybe we could you know create a computer that could do this quantum stuff um but 1998 was the first time when you know, um people actually managed to prove that it, that you could have a physical device that, that works and does the, these things. Um, 2016, um, first quantum computer became available for everyone to use on the cloud. Um, this was from IBM. I'm going to show you at the end a bit of a, um, a little demo of how you can um, interact with IBM's quantum computers via the cloud, via their IBM quantum experience. Um, yeah, and 2017, um, IBM launched its System One, which was the first commercially available 20 qubit quantum computer. Um, and then just most recently in 2019, um, Google claimed that, and this is one that you might have heard about in the news recently, um, Google claimed that their processor had achieved um, quantum supremacy for the first time. Um, and I'm gonna explain to you now about what that term means um, because you might have heard it on the news or in articles. Um, the term quantum supremacy is the idea that this is achieved when a quantum computer is able to do something that no conventional computer could do in a reasonable amount of time or at all. So if the world's you know, most um, advanced supercomputer can't do a certain calculation within like a human lifetime, and a quantum computer can, then that's this idea of quantum supremacy. Um, it's also sometimes called quantum advantage. Quantum advantage is, is kind of the preferred term um, these days because obviously like the word supremacy sounds quite aggressive, has connotations with white supremacy and all these kind of bad stuff. So um, yeah, quantum advantage is, is the better phrase to use. And this is kind of what a, a real quantum computer looks like. Kind of the, the thing that I showed you earlier, the chandelier is kind of the stuff that's inside this kind of white, I don't know, can of beans or I don't know what. Yeah. Um, and there's all this other infrastructure that goes around it um, because it's not as easy as creating like your laptop to create um, a quantum computer. There's a lot of very um, physical limitations um, that uh, make it so difficult to, to, has made it such, so difficult to build quantum computers to this day. Um, and that's the idea of when you're, when you're dealing with qubits, when you're dealing with really, really, really tiny particles, you can, any kind of aspect of the environment could potentially cause that qubit to lose its integrity or, or decohere or, or collapse um, before you finish doing your, um, you know, your operations on it. Um, and just about anything could make a qubit um, uh, lose its, its, its superposition. Um, it could be like vibrations, temperature, like a gust of wind, or it's a little bit cold. They're very fussy particles, you know, so we have to keep them in the nice, um, you know, refrigerated, very, um, you know, sensitive environment to help them like maintain their quantum state. Um, and, even like the most, even the most advanced uh, quantum computers today, those their qubits probably only. I'm not. Don't quote me on this, but it's maybe only like a few microseconds of lifetime in a qubit before it, um, you know, kind of destroys itself and becomes unusable. Um, and this can lead to you getting some kind of incorrect results when you run your experiments on these computers. Um, and we, we give that, we, we talk about that in terms of like noise. 
um, we say where it's a quantum computers these days are quite noisy because um, the qubits themselves don't last for very long before they lose their integrity. Um, and generally speaking, the more qubits you have, the j just like with a classical computer, the more bits you have, the more kind of, I guess, powerful, for lack of a better word, your computer is. It's the same with quantum computers. The more qubits you have, um, the more kind of computational space there is to run your calculations. But this also means that there's more noise that um, those qubits um, you know, because they're all entangled together and so forth, um, it they probably won't last as long and they won't be as, your calculations won't be as accurate. Um, and this is a big field of kind of research at the moment is trying to create, um, trying to create quantum computers that have qubits that last for as long as possible and are good quality qubits. Um, and this is also where I want to talk about the idea of quantum volume. Um, a lot of, you might hear in the news or on a blogs so talking about, oh, increasing the number of qubits, increasing the number of qubits. We have like a 20 qubit quantum computer or something like that, um, or a 50 qubit or hundred qubits. Um, but the actual number of qubits doesn't necessarily represent kind of, I guess, good quality qubits. Um, and because if you have 100 qubit computer, that might sound, sound really impressive, but maybe only 10 of those qubits are actually usable because the rest is just noise. Um, so I think I, it was IBM that kind of coined this, this term um, quantum volume, which um, is meant to be kind of a number that shows like the all round uh, performance of, of a quantum computer. And it takes into account number of qubits, gates, um, errors or like network connectivity, all these kinds of things to kind of give a more kind of realistic idea of the actual kind of qubit computational power of a given um, uh, machine. Um, so this is uh, the kind of, you can see the progress I think of the, um, the IBM quantum computers over the last few years. Um, they, um, we kind of are aiming to double the quantum volume of our systems every single year. Um, last year was actually a really good year. We managed to exceed that, um, that goal. Um, yeah. And we, so, so far we are on track, if not ahead of, of, of that goal. So in the next few years, um, we should start seeing quantum computers really kind of becoming, um, a lot more useful for solving those big, um, challenging project uh, problems because the more qubits we have, the more likely we'll be able to um, start tackling these these kind of big issues. Um, which brings me on to quantum computing, kind of tomorrow. Um, we have, if you compare um, this picture of the new one of the new quantum computers that IBM is kind of putting together. Um, it's a lot bigger. We're hoping to increase the number of qubits. We need a much bigger structure to, to keep them in. Um, and we have this kind of roadmap of where, um, of where we want to be going with quantum computing, not just um, in the hardware side of things, but also um, on the software side. Um, so we're in kind of 2021 now. And between like last year and this year, we're really starting to see um, a ramping up of focus on doing more kind of high level applications on quantum computers. So, um, you know, going forward, we want to be able to use, um, you know, apply the quantum circuits that we're building to, um, you know, chemistry um, problems, to finance, machine learning, all these kinds of things, um, which is really great because it means that, um, you know, previously maybe, um, to make a real kind of impact in this industry, um, you needed to have a very, very strong kind of physics background. But um, I think we'll see kind of going forward that more and more kind of um, subject matter expertise um, is gonna be really useful for helping like apply these um, quantum computing um, systems in like real world applications. Um, so a few examples, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but like in finance, for example, um, quantum computing is potentially being, we're, you know, is being researched in a lot of different areas from like credit scoring, fraud detection, um, Monte Carlo simulations for like doing 
um, risk profiling and um, calculating options, prices, and stuff like that. Um, there's a large area of application in finance, um, absolutely. Chemistry is also a massive um, area. Um, anything from like understanding uh, genomes, understanding, um, you know, how DNA sequences um, kind of activate or inhibit certain genes, um, discovering, um, you know, new small drugs, um, small molecule drugs, um, based on if you for chemistry specifically, when you think about like down to the molecular level of, of cells and proteins, um, you get these really massively long chains of amino acids. And there's so many different variables, um, you know, similar to our <laughs> similar to our, um, you know, UK holiday road trip problem, as soon as you kind of increase the number of of locations, as soon as you increase the number of atoms in your molecule, you're massively increasing the um, the complexity of, of what it is you're trying to figure out. So, um, uh, and like for example, how do you predict how a protein is going to fold? It's got you know thousands and, and millions of of um, amino acids and, and atoms that make that up, and they're all going to interact with each other in different ways to create a certain kind of structure. Um, so if we can somehow understand all of these variables enough that we can make pre accurate predictions on that, that could really help us um, discover new drugs that we wouldn't have considered or prevent, um, you know, spending too much time on, on you know, testing molecules in, um, that actually we can simulate um, with, com with quantum computers. Cybersecurity. Um, this is kind of a, one of the more kind of scarier um, kind of areas that quantum computing can um, ha have an effect on us. Um, if we think about um, the way that our encryption today, uh, or most of our cybersecurity principles are based on on encryption, which use mathematical um, kind of formulas um, that basically just take a really really long time to decode. Um, and that's kind of the, the underlying concept for a lot of, um, you know, our online cybersecurity. Um, that's why that you, you hear about how when you're making a password, it should be, you know, uh, unique characters and numbers and as long as possible. And the longer and more complicated you make your password, basically the longer it takes for a classical computer to be able to crack it because it just takes the computer so long to do the maths to figure it out. Um, so like here you see, like as soon as you get to kind of a 12 character um, password with a mixture of lower and uppercase letters, it's gonna take a normal computer like 600 years to compute, right? But with a quantum computer, you have a massive speed up in this ability to do those, ma those mathematical calculations. So maybe that would only take two seconds to crack in a, quant a very powerful quantum computer. So this is one of the areas that um, is kind of worth pay, um, keeping an eye on. Um, and there's also, I guess, the kind of natural kind of solution to the potential problem that quantum computers could bring to cybersecurity is to create quantum solutions and start building kind of quantum encryption methods that um, are just a lot harder for quantum computers to crack as well. So this is also an area that we need, you know, cybersecurity experts to get on board with, even if they don't know the first thing about quantum physics. And there's, yeah, there's so many other areas, like I already mentioned, like logistics and supply chain, there's machine learning, there's all sorts of different areas that you can apply it to. Um, and we just simply don't know yet. We need more people to come and, and um, lend their subject matter expertise um, and start getting interested in, in quantum computing. Okay, so that is all of the wordy theory, the quantum physics-y stuff is all over. You can breathe, relax. Now we're going to get back to familiar territory. We're going to start talking about coding. Yay. Um, so I'm going to show you guys a very, um, a, a pretty simple demo. What we're going to do is we're going to create a very common um, quantum state called, called the Bell state, um, which is probably one of the simplest quantum circuits that you could create. 
it has two qubits and two classical bits. We're going to put one of those qubits into a superposition. We're going to entangle it to the second qubit. And then we're going to measure the outcome. And you remember, like I said, when you just measure a single qubit um, in its superposition, it will be a 50-50 chance of giving an output of zero or one. Well, when you have that single qubit entangled to another qubit, then you're going to get a 50-50 chance of getting zero, zero or one, one. Um, yeah, and just a quick recap on the quantum gates. Um, we have, I already mentioned the Hadamard gate. This is the gate that's going to take our qubit and put it into a, um, a superposition. And then what we have here is something called a controlled not gate or a C not gate. And this is the um, bit that will kind of do the entangling with the one that's in, a, in the superposition state um, and entangle it to the second qubit. Um, and the way that a, a controlled not gate works is that if qubit A, for example, is a one, then it will flip B to also be a one. So when A is one, B is one. If A is zero, then nothing will happen and this second qubit won't get flipped. So if A is at zero, then B will also stay at zero, which is why we're going to get our outcome as being either one, one or zero, zero and not zero, one or one, zero. Okay. I'm just going to, sorry. Oh no, hold on. It, put it up on my other screen, bear with. Okay, can you guys see, see my screen okay? Like you see the IBM quantum experience? We can. Great, awesome. Okay, so this is the IBM quantum experience, um, which any of you can log into and um, get your, you know, and get access to some quantum computers. You can sign up with your email. Um, you can keep track of any experiments that you want to run. Um, and there's a few couple of um, cool features that I'm going to quickly show you. The first one is the quantum um, composer, which um, essentially, if you're maybe like not as confident with coding, um, then you can um, put together like your own circuit using kind of like drag and drop. Um, kind of components. Here I've kind of, um, this, this is a circuit I prepared, prepared earlier to show you what we're going to do. So we have, this will be our first, this line here represents our first qubit, this one represents our second qubit, and this um, represents the kind of classical bits that we're going to be measuring onto. This, we're going to add our Hadamard gate first, then we're going to add our C not gate to entangle, make an entangled state. And then we're going to do a measurement on both of the qubits to be able to get um, to see what the, the outcome will be in normal zeros and ones. Um, yeah, so this is a nice way to, to kind of see things quite visually. Um, what you can also um, go to is if you um, want to do things in a more kind of code first approach. Um, there is this um, area called the quantum lab, which is where um, you can, if you're familiar with um, Jupyter notebooks, um, it's kind of the same thing. It's just in a nice kind of wrapper. Um, oh, I don't think I've mentioned this yet. I probably should have, um, but we're going to be using Kizkit, which is the IBM quantum um, SDK, and it's all written in Python. So you don't need to learn any fancy new language to be able to um, code on quantum computers. If you already know some Python, um, then you're, you're kind of all set to go. Um, and yeah, so I think we, I'm going to show you how to kind of create that um, circuit that I just kind of showed you visually. Um, first thing I'm going to do is just make sure I've imported the right things. I'm just going to import kind of the whole lot. Um, okay, so the first thing that we need to do is create um, a quantum register and a classical register that will kind of come together and create our quantum circuit. So I'm just going to um, start typing that. I apologize if my 
computer is, my uh, keyboard is very loud. Um, I'll try to talk over it. <laughs> okay, so now we're just creating a quantum register. We're gonna add um, two qubits to it. And I'm just gonna name them each one qubit, just so it's easier when we do a visualization to see what um, it is. Um, and I'm also going to create um, a classical register with two classical bits, like so. Again, with two, two classical bits, and I'm gonna just call it classical. I'm not very creative. Um, next, we're gonna kind of put these registers together into um, a quantum circuit. So taking the Q bits and the C bits. And then just so we can kind of see what we're doing, I'm gonna just draw, draw it out. I wanna make it a bit pretty, so I'm going to um, display it in a matplotlib kind of format. If I hit shift enter, great. So we could kind of see the, the beginnings of a, of a quantum circuit here. There's no gates on it yet. It's just a few qubits and a few classical bits. Um, and now we're going to um, start applying some gates. So um, in order to, uh, firstly, what we want to do is apply that Hadamard gate to put our qubit into its superposition. Um, to do that, we just simply do quantum circuit dot H. And I want to specify which qubit I want to put the Hadamard gate on. So I can treat um, kind of the, the qubits um, array as an array and specify um, I'm going to put the gate on on qubit zero. And again, let's just draw it out. Great, ta-da. And there we have it. We've cre created two qubits and we put one of them into superposition. Now we're gonna do the, add the C knot so that we can entangle the two qubits together. So to do that, we're gonna do qc dot cx, um, not c not in x is another name for a not gate in classical computing. So it's just simpler to do cx representing controlled x or controlled not. Um, that's just how it's, it's specified in Qiskit. Um, and I'm gonna specify which qubit um, is gonna be entangled to both. So I'm gonna um, make the the qubit that we put into superposition as the control qubit and um, the target qubit is gonna be the other one. And again, I'll just draw it out for you. There we go. Okay, so now that we have our nice little, this is, this is all to get taken all together is what's called the Bell state. Um, so a qubit that's in superposition that's entangled to another one. And now we're just going to um, measure both of those qubits. And then once we've, because we can't actually see what outcomes we're gonna get until we add a measurement gate. So we're gonna do that now. Just again, pretty simple, qc.measure. And we're gonna use qubits and qubits. So this is basically saying, I'm going to put a measurement on the qubits and have that outcome stored in classical bits. So then we can run classical um, programs and computations on the, the outcome because we put them into, um, into a more classical form. Again, draw it for you. There we go. And you can see this kind of looks roughly similar to what I was showing you in the um, in the um, composer kind of view. Um, this is just one that you can kind of build as you go along and you can do slightly more complicated things. Um, okay, so now, what, now that we have constructed our circuit, normally what you would do if we wanted to run this um, on a quantum computer is we would send it to a back end as a job, wait for that job to run and then get it back. 
um, because that process actually takes a little bit of time um, and you know we we don't have that much time um, today because we want to press on um, so what I'm going to be using instead is um, a simulator um, because this is such a simple circuit we can just simulate the answer because we're pretty sure we, we like know what the outcomes should be um, and uh, Kiskit has um, a library called Air that contains all of the simulator backends, um, and I can just print out a list of of those backends. So you can see um, there's a whole lot of different um, types. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about what all these different things do. Um, it's kind of very specific to more of the kind of the deeper physics side of things. Um, but definitely go and like look these up yourselves, and um, yeah, have an explore. The one that we're going to use today is going to be called the chasm simulator. So to do that, I have to get to the back end and specify. Um, I'm going to, well, the air simulator is kind of like the default simulator, which is the one we're, we're going to use, um, which I think is just a chasm simulator under the hood, if my memory is correct. Um, and then what we need to do is we have to take our quantum circuit and transpile it um, to be able to run on this on this simulator. Um, to do that, we just do circ equals transpile. So circ is like the transpiled circuit. Um, QC is the, is the one that we just created. And the simulator is the one that we just fetched. And then... Um, I want to run the, I want to run this transpiled circuit on the simulator and get a result for it. So to do that, I'm going to say res result. I'd be a much better programmer if I could spell properly. Um, yeah, simulator dot run. Um, we're going to run the transpiled circuit on the simulator, and I'm going to specify. 1024 shots um what this means is in um you know you know if we were running this on a real quantum computer um the idea is the increased number of, of times that we run this circuit on the back end um the more accurate the result is going to be um because there's a lot of noise if you just run it once um you don't know if if that the run that you did it is going to give you an accurate result. So it's best to like run quite a lot and then get like an average of what the outcomes are so that you can see, um, you know, kind of get a bit of a more accurate picture. It doesn't matter so much for a simulator, but um, it's just to kind of like show it as similar to, to what it would be on the real thing as possible. I need to get the result from that. Um, yeah, okay, so, and then I wanna get the counts. We wanna be able to count how many times our um, circuit um, measured uh, kind of collapsed down to zero and how many times it collapsed down to one. So we can do that by saying we're gonna get the counts. Um, and that's just result.get counts. And I might, we can either just print out the number of counts if you want. We could do that um, just to get see a number. Great, there we go. So we've seen, we have taken that circuit, we have run it 1,024 times on the simulator, and we can see that for 512 of those times, we got zero, and 512 of those times, we got one, one, one. Um, obviously, because as a simulator, you're going to get a perfect 50-50 split. If it was on a real quantum computer, you might get a lot of zero zeros, a lot of one ones, and then maybe a couple of zero ones or one zeros or, or something like that. Um, we can also plot it as a histogram, just you know, for fun. If we want to see it written out nicely, give it a title. Okay. There we go. As you can see, exactly 50-50 split, zero, zero, and one, one. Um, yeah, so 
there we go. That was your little demo. Um, there are plenty of um, kind of, if you, oh, uh, before I say that, I should say that all of the Kiskit code is open sourced. So you can go onto GitHub and look for Kiskit, look, have a look at all of the code that is used to actually, um, you know, build the SDK. Um, and if you want to get involved and you think, oh, you find a bug or you think that it should be able to do this feature that it's not currently doing, um, then uh, please go ahead and like open an issue, kind of have an explore, see what's happening. Um, yeah, that's one of the um, yeah, one of the really great things about about um, this community is is we do everything in public. Um, yeah, so I just showed you how to run your first um, circuit on a on a quantum computer. Um, if you want to learn a bit more, go a bit deeper on the physics, um, do some more complicated things, there are a ton of research of uh, resources that. Um, Kiskit has put together. We have the main Kiskit website, um, which does shows you everything from like community events, documentation. There's a, a textbook, which um, is a really nice way of kind of approaching the more kind of physics um, principles without necessarily having to go and read a lot of um, very complicated and boring uh, physics papers. This kind of presents it in a much more kind of approachable uh, way. Um, there's also the Kiskit blog, the Kiskit YouTube, whatever your learning style, there are um, things that you can uh, find to kind of help you get, um, you know, progress in your, in your quantum journey. Um, also, of course, socials, um, you can follow Kiskit, IBM Research on Twitter. You could also follow me on Twitter if you want. There's also a, a Slack channel, um, uh, oh no, Slack workspace, sorry, um, that has a whole load of different channels for like getting started right the way through to like, you know, doing really complicated things. There are so many different ways to kind of have discussions about this and um, get more involved. Um, and yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Time for questions. <laughs> Um, yeah, thanks very much, everyone. Amazing. Thank you so much, Abby. Um, wow. Um, I'm really impressed with how you took all that information and actually made it fairly reasonable to follow. <laughs> I hope so. Uh, I hope I didn't lose too many of you. <laughs> no, no, really, really amazing. Um, I do have to ask, if I don't code on a quantum computer, does that make me a classical developer? Is that what <laughs> we're called now? <laughs> Makes you so, a basic developer. <laughs> Um. Yeah. <laughs> no, cool, cool, very good. Um, yeah, we do have some questions. Um, but if you have any more questions, please go ahead and type them in the chat while we go through these ones. So the first question is, um, was, uh, wasn't quantum entanglement the phenomenon that we thought might break the speed of light or, or the information constraint? But yes. Um, and it freaked a lot of people out in the 1920s and 30s. And they were like, what? Faster than the speed of light? No, it's not possible. Ah! Um, and then are there any specific ethical questions other than cybersecurity on your radar compared to classical algorithms, um, which we know often tend to replicate existing biases and inequities? Yeah, for sure. Um, not that I know of, purely because we are still very, very early on. And we're still at the moment, just trying to figure out how to get the quantum computers to even do the same things. But absolutely, I think as soon as we start, you know, using quantum computers to do the same things that classical computers can do, we're going to face the same um, issues in that, you know, it's only as good as the developers that put them together and obviously subject to the same kind of biases. Um, if anything, I think that, you know, some of the ethical issues that are coming up as a result of emerging areas in classical computers means that, um, you know, we are already aware of those kinds of issues that when we take it into the quantum field, it won't be like a new thing that comes up. Hopefully we should have enough experience with, for example, dealing with bias in 
AI classically to be able to know that's an issue by the time it becomes possible in a quantum um, capacity. I hope anyway. <laughs> Well, thank you. And then in 2019, you started in a very different role, web development. How mm. did you get into quantum? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so I, yeah, my, <laughs> my background is very um, interesting. I, um, you know, came through a lot of different routes to becoming a software developer. Um, and But I actually heard about quantum computing first in like a chemistry space. I studied chemistry at uni uh, for a lot of my modules and that's where I first came across this idea of quantum computing as a way to um, potentially have like a massive um, impact on um, on kind of the production of new drugs um, at some point in the future. And I found that really inspiring. Um, and then just because of, you know, what I ended up doing at the time, I ended up going down a more software route. And then when I got into IBM, I, you know, I, I recognized that IBM is, is you know, a leader in, in the quantum computing space. And um, I started to kind of reach out to people there and, kind of just discovered this, you know, really amazing community of, um, of developers building Kiskit. And I started to realize that actually there, you know, there is room for non-physicists to be able to have a real impact in this space. And from then it was just like, I guess, just perseverance and determine and determination. I just kind of was thinking, okay, how do I approach this from a software development mindset? Um, and as you can see, like I went through most of this um, talk without using much um, quantum physics knowledge because mainly because I don't have very much. Um, and I'm still managing to, you know, make my way through it, teach myself the things that I, I really do need to know because obviously it does help if you can understand the physics. Um, but there's also definitely areas that, I can bring a unique perspective to because of my software background or whatever other background it is, especially as we move forward towards more kind of higher level applications um, era. Very cool, really nice, lovely. Um, great, well, that is it for this evening. Thank you so very much, Abby. Thank you so very much, Aisha. Um, it was an absolute pleasure to host you and we are very grateful for sharing your experiences with our community today. Um, if you yourself would like to give a talk in the future, as I mentioned, our CFPs are always open. Um, you can either reach out to us via Meetup or you can join our Slack group and chat to us there um, and we'd be happy to host you. Thank you, everybody, and have a lovely evening.